Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. This is the word of the Lord. Sometimes, Silence is golden. Sometimes it is deafening. Pure silence can be a difficult thing to find when you really need it. If you have papers to write and you desperately just need 15 more minutes of sleep, it's almost inevitable that you'll be able to hear strains of your neighbor's favorite TV show through the ceiling or that a particularly annoying bird song outside your window will weasel its way into your brain, destroying the solace of your last moments of peace. But at other times, silence is the last thing we need. If you've ever laid awake at night worrying, unable to turn off your brain, you know that a little noise to break up that silence can be a gift. Or when you're waiting for the silence to be broken by your phone ringing with that incredibly important call. Or when the clash and clamor of conflict has crescendoed and peaked leaving in its wake a silence of all the things still left unexpressed. These silences can be too long, unnerving, scary. Sometimes, silence is golden. And sometimes, it is deafening. Today we encounter the prophet Elijah, whose life had become pretty loud. Our passage begins with King Ahab, telling on Elijah to his wife Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was a worshiper of the foreign god Baal, and Ahab had converted to her religion, which is a big problem for a Hebrew king. Earlier verses in 1 Kings tell us that Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than had all the kings that were before him. And if you read through the book of 1 Kings, that's really saying something. And as we know from the stories of Hebrew scripture, prophets aren't generally sent by God are, sorry, are generally sent by God to make trouble for troublemaking kings. And Elijah's story fits that bill. Because of Ahab's alignment with this foreign deity, God had sent a drought to Israel, and Elijah got to break that news that that was coming to the king. And after that, the prophet had this dramatic encounter 
With the prophets of Baal and a sort of fire and brimstone showdown, you may be familiar with this story, the challenge was to see whose God would call down, would call down fire upon a sacrifice and thus prove themselves to be the true God. Some 450 prophets of Baal cried out for their God to send down fire onto the altar from morning until noon until their voices were raw with desperation. And Elijah mocked them, saying, Maybe your God has gone off to meditate, or perhaps he fell asleep. The English Standard Version goes with a cruder translation. Maybe your God has gone off to relieve himself. But all the prophets of Baal, all they got back was silence. Deafening silence. Then Elijah did his thing called upon the God of Israel to send down fire. And so much fire came down that it not only ate up the sacrifice, but the wood and the stones and the dust all around, even drying up a full trench of water that Elijah had dug around the altar. And after this, Elijah killed all 450 of his prophets, which is obviously terrible. Like, we would have been fine, right, with this story just ending with Elijah winning the contest and then having the credits roll on this episode of extreme worship. But something that we need to remember as we read the Hebrew scriptures is that as a, as a genre, a lot of the things we read in the Old Testament, uh, they fit more into the same category of an Avengers movie than they do, say, with the stories of the New Testament. The Hebrew scriptures are filled with these mythic stories, these epic narratives and sweeping poems, and they're often filled with hyperbole, with grand exaggeration. These stories are concerned with the broadest strokes of good and evil and might and right, without quite as much nuance as we in the 21st century might prefer. They come from a different worldview than our own, and so the things that, would, that do offend and appall us now would not have had the same ring to the original hearers and tellers of these stories. The, the victory depicted in this story would have resonated in a particular way with the original hearers, even though it turns our stomachs now. But even in the way our reading began for today, we can hear a deeper lesson that is incredibly relevant to us if we look for it. Ahab tells on Elijah to his wife Jezebel, and Jezebel sends a message to Elijah that says, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them, that is the prophets of Baal, by this time tomorrow. As you have done to my prophets, so I will do to you. And then Elijah got up and fled for his life. Those in power were angry with him and had set their sights on him, and he was afraid. Now, this guy had just summoned his god to send down fire. And has somehow managed, basically on his own, to kill 450 prophets. Why is he suddenly now afraid? I wonder if Elijah didn't find himself thinking about what had happened with those prophets of Baal. I wonder if he didn't find himself thinking about what had happened when they desperately called upon their God and heard back only in silence. The vulnerability of that position, the shame they must have felt in that moment, the fear and the pain that they then endured at Elijah's hand. I wonder if there might have been something about his own actions and this cyclical nature of violence that might have just freaked Elijah out a little bit. His violence had triggered these latest threats of violence from Jezebel and Ahab. Violence beginning violence. And we see that all over the Hebrew scriptures, right? And we also see it in real time all over the world now. And in what these stories fail to express in the silences, aren't we compelled to ask, is this really what the God of creation had in mind for us? So Elijah was shaken up and he fled for his life. He struck out alone on foot to seek asylum in the kingdom of Judah, and Elijah, who seems to be inclined to go a little further than he needs to, heads on out into the wilderness, far from the reach of the powers pursuing him. 
He lands under the shade of a desert tree, exhausted. Maybe conflicted. Definitely discouraged. And all alone. As he sat there, feet aching, mind racing, hot and tired, he said to God, Enough. It is enough now, O oh Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. How many of us have had a moment like that? This moment of realization, why can't things be different? Why can't things change? How much more of this could there be? No. This mission that Elijah had been on as a prophet to speak truth to power, to stand up to these rulers who provoked his God and eliminated other prophets before him had brought Elijah to a breaking point. And he was done. He could not imagine doing it anymore, being who he was called to be anymore. He had had enough. And there he fell into an uneasy sleep, wondering if God would answer him, or if he might experience the same kind of silence that those prophets of Baal had. And then a gentle touch and the sound of a voice awakens him from his troubled sleep. Get up and eat. And they're waiting for him with some water and a cake. He ate and he drank and he laid back down like you might do on a sick day. When your mom wakes you up just long enough to check your temperature, give you your medicine so you can eat some soup, and then send you back to bed. Elijah rested his weary body and his brain a while longer, and the angel returned with the same gentle instruction. Get up and eat. This time also saying, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Elijah already knew that the journey was too much for him, right? He was afraid and hopeless and tired and alone. But then he was met with a gentle word and some snacks and time for a couple of naps. I'm not sure that there's anything much better that God or anyone else can do for someone who's overwhelmed and hurting than calmly and gently affirming that it is okay to rest, to accept some help, to care for themselves well, and then to rest some more. So after this respite, this holy Sabbath, Elijah got up and journeyed on, then for 40 days and nights to Mount Horeb, the same mountain, incidentally, where another prophetic leader, Moses, had encountered God. Like Elijah, Moses had experienced moments where he wanted to throw in the towel on his call and on the people of Israel, but also like Elijah, God had stayed faithful to Moses through all of his mistakes and frustrations. But once Elijah had settled into the quiet and darkness of a cave, another word came to him. Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah answered out of the fullness of his fear and hopelessness and exhaustion. I've been zealous. Your people have continually messed up. I'm all alone. My very life is on the line. In this cave up on this mountain, Elijah seems to be having a, a rock bottom moment. I've been good, and they've been bad, and I'm alone and afraid, and I've had enough of this, God. I can't do it anymore. You may have been in a place like this before, where you can't imagine taking one more step forward, where the injustice of the world or the pain that you feel seems to be more than you can take. Like Elijah, you may have held in one hand all of the ways that you have tried your very hardest or sought understanding, and in the other hand held all of the ways that you feel like you failed or missed something. And you may have had a hard time finding any kind of balance under the weight of this burden. Like Elijah, you may have wondered if God would say anything else at all. But God did speak again. Go out and stand on the mountain. Because the Lord is going to pass by. 
And so weary and worn out, Elijah did as he was told. He had seen God act dramatically by sending down all-consuming fire, and he had seen God act through the quiet provision of food to eat and permission to rest. So who knows what Elijah might have been expecting from God then and there on that mountain, but he went out to wait. And the wind came so strong that it broke apart the mountain where the law had been given and where Elijah's very community had been formed. An earthquake shook the very foundations upon which Elijah stood as if he hadn't already been shaken enough. Fire flashed once again before Elijah's eyes, calling back the violence and destruction that he had been a part of because of his own prophetic zeal. But God wasn't in those things. God wasn't in the destructive voices and forces that swirled around Elijah. God wasn't in the fear-mongering and the shame. And God wasn't in the vengeance. No, God was in that sound of sheer silence. The space that had existed before the noise and chaos had torn things apart, and the space that hung in the air after. The space that underlied all of it. In the beginning was the Word, and that Word emerged from formlessness, darkness, silence kind of silence that we so often scramble to fill, right? With the loveless tongues of mortals and angels that resound as noisy gongs and clanging cymbals, the kind of silence that can make us uncomfortable and, and restless. But it is in this silence, the silence on either end of the explosion, the storm, the flames, it is in this silence that we have to remember that God is at work. God was at work. In the silence of the two and a half years between Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and June 19th of 1865, when General Granger led his regiment to the great state of Texas to inform them that all slaves were free. That there was an absolute equality of rights between former masters and slaves and that the connection that would now exist between them was that of employer and free labor. God was at work in the era of silence that accompanied the long, muted stories of gay and trans Americans, the silence that began to erode through their patient yet passionate activism until their fight for equal rights erupted at the, for the first time at the Stonewall Riots in New York City in the June of 1969. God was at work in my life in the silence that hung between a, a devastating departure from the church as a 20-something and a return to the church not that many years ago. God was at work in me, healing me from the pain inflicted by old and toxic dogma, and God was at work in the communities who would later receive me with open arms, who would help me to reconstruct my faith, and who would eventually drown out the noise and convince me that God knows me and loves me and calls me God's own. God has been at work in your silences and continues to be. If you find yourself listening desperately for a word from God, for an answer to prayer, for a response to your cries for justice and what you hear is silence, it does not mean that God is not at work. God works in the spaces where chaos cannot reign. God works in the inspiration that can come from finding that quiet center, from lingering on our dreams for this world and for listening to how God is calling us to realize them. Silence can be deafening. Beloved, do not despair in the silence, but know that God is in it, working through it, listening to you, preparing you for the same question that God asked of Elijah, what are you doing here? And may the times of silence that we experience get us ready to answer that question very well.